Well, good evening and welcome to CMJ UK's Thursday night interviews. Our guest tonight has made a huge contribution to the teaching of the Jewish roots of our faith. He's a man of many talents and has faithfully taken part in numerous organizations, helping them to run smoothly and with some order. Influenced by men such as Derek White, the founder of Christian Friends of Israel and David Pawson, Roy began to understand that there was a missing piece in his faith, its Jewish roots. From envelope stuffer to director of CFI and from computer whiz kid to running a guest house in Landudno, he's done it all. Please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Roy Thurley. Roy, we're going to do the notices at the end and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Now you have <laughs> you have a father, and I can get the slides up if that's okay. Um, who was in the army during the Second World War, and in fact, we'll leave those till the end if that's okay, Elias, and then we can just skip. I'll move it along. Oh yeah, thank you. So you had a connection with Israel before you knew that you needed one before it became of any importance to you what happened well actually it's before i was born um my father who you can see there pictured uh it, he was in palestine as it was then called during the second world war he was in the royal electrical and mechanical engineers and he was based in haifa and uh he when he came back from there, when he was demobbed in 1946, um, I appeared the following year. So in that sense, I have a link back with pre-state Israel. Mm. And um, we've got a picture of your early family here. So which one are you? I'm the little one in that picture. And that is my brother, Alan. He uh, was nine years older than me. Um, Alan actually died uh, nearly five years ago, um, but uh, the, the rocking horse has not died and we still have it here in our house. It's changed colour a few times since, but uh, although I don't ride it myself any longer, we do have it here so that any little children that we have around, grandchildren, whatever, can enjoy riding it. So where was it that you lived at this time? Where were you? At that stage, that, that was the house I was born in, and that is in Collier's Wood, uh, which is southwest London. And if you know your underground map, it's two stops before the end, getting towards Morden on the northern line. All right, okay. So, and that, that's not your complete family, is it? Because here you are at the beach. Um, yeah, well, actually, I'm hardly in that. I'm, I'm the little one down at the bottom, but that's my brother. And uh, my sister is on the other side. And that's my mum mm -hmm. in the middle. That was when we were on a holiday, um, and I can't remember where, somewhere in Kent. Yeah, I was thinking it was Wales, but she wasn't Welsh, was she, your mum? Oh, no, not at all. She was a Kentish girl. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you actually grew up in a Christian household, um, and I think it was Methodist, which uh, it was is this the church? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, that is the rebuilt church. The the one that uh, I first remembered uh, was built just to, to the left of where you see it on that picture. And uh, that, that was an old chapel that had been there for, I don't know, 100 or two years. Um, but it was too mm -hmm. small for yeah. the congregation. And uh, it was pulled down and that was built. And that was opened when I was probably about 10 years old, I should think. Because... I mean, Methodists are not known for their love of Israel these days, are they? <laughs> um, in some many quarters. Um, but you were at a Methodist church. Were they um, open to this or, or closed? Well, it was, um, the, I mean, the, the church is still there and functioning. Um, 
I I was there until uh, basically and, and until I got married. So I was there through my teenage oh. years and, and early twenties. So I stayed there all that time. Um, no, I didn't. I had no teaching in terms of Israel during the time that I was there. I wouldn't say they were hostile. It was just a subject that wasn't dealt with. It just wasn't a part of it, yeah. Okay, so you uh, grew up, and at eighteen, you went off to university, and uh, and here you are as a student. Where did you go? Well, I went to the University of Kent at Canterbury, uh, which was in fact a brand new university. I was one of the first mm -hmm. five hundred students to go there. In fact, when I went for my interview, which was in the January, February, before going into September, I wondered whether my first year's course was going to be in plumbing or something, because the building was still being built at the time. And, um, uh, you know, it, it didn't look as though it was going to be ready. It was almost ready by the time I arrived in September. But I went there um, to study maths with computing as an option. Uh, remember, this was back in 1965 when computers were only just coming on the scene. But I wanted to get involved in this newfangled stuff. So that's what I went for. The bad news was that when I arrived there, they told me that the computer had not arrived because um, <laughs> this computer was needed its own room. It was air conditioned and everything like that. And it had not arrived. And so therefore, instead of doing maths with computing, I would be doing maths with statistics. Now that was very bad news as far as I was concerned because I've uh, always been bored by statistics and wasn't really interested in that topic at all, but I didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So I had to do maths with statistics. So you were actually doing uh, pure maths, applied maths, and not your hoped for computing, but statistics. So it wasn't only, um, yeah, you didn't just do those subjects, but while you were there, there were lots of um, societies to join, weren't there? <laughs> and I think you were setting oh, it up because no. you were only 500 students. So I've actually managed to find the table tennis team write up uh, from 1965. I think it is, is it say December? I can't quite see that now. Um, but you're not actually mentioned in there, but tell us about your your hobbies. Okay, well, actually, I'm, I'm not mentioned in there, but there are three people mentioned at the end, the last one of which mm -hmm. is Dean Tyler. That's Dave Tyler. Yeah. And in the uh, fourth term when I was there, when we weren't living in, in the Hall of Residence, I actually shared a room with him in a house in, um, you know, when we were out in digs. So I, I haven't seen that at all, but... Um, Yes, I, I, I was a, no, he, uh, sorry? No, no, he's the one you're going to tell us a story about in a minute then. I didn't know. In a minute, that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, quite. So, so that's, where, that's where, in a sense, where we met in terms of university was through playing table, table tennis together. And then we decided yeah. that we would share a room together when we went out into digs. Uh -huh. But the other thing about well, Incan was that I was the star, one of the staff photographers for it. Photography has been a long-term interest of mine, going back to my teens, early teens. And um, obviously, they were setting up a new use newspaper. They've got no staff to do anything. And I said, well, I'm quite happy to take some photographs, um, you know, which is obviously black and white film. And they gave me a key to the dark room so I could go in whenever I wanted to and develop the film and, and, and print and whatever. And, uh, yeah. and, and that's what I did. So I did a fair amount yeah. of that for the student newspaper. That's really good. I noticed when I was reading through this um, that the subs for doing table tennis were 10 shillings a year. Um, and the subs for doing the tiddlywinks club was one tiddlywink. <laughs> so I thought that was <laughs> quite comical. But I think the table oh, tennis yeah. and the tiddlywinkers got on really well together, didn't they? But um, sure now is. here is Mr. Tyler. It is indeed. That's Dave Tyler. And, and that is the house in which we had um, a room uh, on the uh, on the fortunately on the first floor of the house. And um, what happened was that one Sunday morning, and of course, you know, as students, um, Sunday mornings didn't really exist until quite late. But um, 
when I got up, uh, you know, got dressed and everything, I was up first and I went downstairs to um, organize some breakfast for myself because we were left to do that when necessary. And um, I, I noticed that the, uh, the, the hallway in the house was underwater and there was a note pinned to the top of the newel post which said, have left, have left home, help yourself. <laughs> Basically, oh, along those lines. So the owners had had done a runner because of the flood and le left us to do whatever we needed to do. So I went back up and um, roused David and we had a look at see what we could do. And we decided that what we would do is to get together the essentials that we would need for the next couple of days and put them in bags and then evacuate. Now, I had a, a motor scooter at the time. Uh, Lambretta LD125, actually, for anybody who's uh, watching that is interested in these things. And it was parked out um, just off road, but on a higher piece of land than what you're looking at here. So it was actually completely dry apart from the bottom inch of the tires. Um, so anyway, I, I, I said, look, you know, let, let's just go up to the college and we'll go to the domestic bursa and see what she can do for us because, you know, we can't live here. So, always the photographer, I made sure that I had the camera around my neck and went across. Now, Dave, um, as a child, he had suffered from polio. And as a result of that, he was slightly handicapped in the way that he walked. So, I said to him, look, I'll go first. And uh, if I find anything, you know, like a, an un unlikely pit or sharp stones or something, uh, as I walk across, because we went across barefoot, um, I, at least you'll know where they are when you come. So otherwise, follow me. So I went across, and then obviously the the uh, flood got less and less as I got towards the road. So I turned around to say, come on, Dave, you can come now. Got out the camera and took some pictures of him as he waded through the water, which he wasn't best pleased about, to be honest. Uh, I mean, oh. it's not the most flattering of poses oh. for anybody, is it? But um, I thought, well, you know, this is news, and I'm, and I'm a photographer for the newspaper. So um, that's what I did, and we, you know, when we went on the scooter up to um, up to the university, found the domestic bursa, uh, told her our problems, and she put us up in a guest room for a few nights. And my next job was straight away down to the dark room, uh, develop the film, and this was uh, one of the prints that came out. So this was on the front page of the next edition of Incant, but also. Um, Incant was actually printed for us. Uh, we didn't have our own printing press. It was printed for us by the Kent Messenger. So uh, when they got it, they said, could they use that as well? So it then became on the front page of the Kent Messenger. Uh, so that's my one claim to fame of having been at university is that I got a photo on the front page of the local paper. Ace photographer. Actually, it's really deep, isn't it? It's up to his knees. Uh, to, uh, not so clever. Oh, yeah. Now, you, yeah. you didn't finish your university course why was that uh, basically um at, at the end of the fourth term you had the part one examinations mm -hmm. and so i had a part one examination in pure maths one in applied maths and one in statistics and you had to pass all three papers in order to go on to the second part of your course and um, i passed pure maths and i passed applied maths and i failed stats which um surprised nobody but it meant that I was sent down from university. Oh, but that was at Christmas of 1966. Correct. Now, you not told me that. Your... Sorry? I said not the best of Christmases. No, I actually think it was pretty miserable. <laughs> Dear. Um, but your family were big into scouting and you were a senior scout. Yeah. And as a result of that and someone that you met there, you ended up going to see a careers advisor, I think. Yes, I did. Um, but the, the you, you've missed out the most important part, actually, of that interval between me being a student and me getting a job. Because I came to realize that actually, the way that I had run my life wasn't exactly successful. In fact, I was a failure. But fortunately, I recognized that God collects failures. So it was at that point in my life that I actually made a commitment to the Lord. 
I don't have a date and time for that, but it was somewhere at the end of December or the beginning of January, 66, 67, uh, and in that time scale, I actually made a commitment to the Lord and asked him to run my life for me since I was making a bit of a mess of it myself. Okay, now the other bit yeah. was, yes, um, the senior scout leader at the um, troop that I went to, he worked for Wandsworth Borough Council and he mm. suggested I should go along and talk to their careers advisor, which I did. And he um, said that there were vacancies as a clerk in accountancy or technical drawing. And so I went for the accountancy one, got that, and did 18 months of pen pushing in, uh, in accountancy. But then the council was advertising internally for trainee programmers. So uh, that's what I wanted to do anyway, was computing. So I applied, I got one of the jobs, and this that you see in the picture was the computer, which had only just arrived. It's an ICT 1903. Um, as you can see, it's got tape decks. That was for uh, storage of all data, programs and everything. And it's all controlled by that um, electric typewriter that you've got there. And um, as well as the tape decks, it had a, a card reader for reading eight column cards and a line and printer which, uh, so that was in and out, and that was all there was to it. Um, but it was, a, a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to use. Oh, the storage capacity, I, I mean, this is, this is a joke for, for, for most people, but the, the, the storage capacity was 16K words, and each word was four six-bit characters. So equivalent to 64K, if you like, in today's uh, ones. And you can see the size of it and um, the fact that it was in an air-conditioned room. And 64K so, these days is, well, pinprick size, are, isn't it? Are you saying are you saying 64 bits or 64 gigabytes? I mean, not no, gigabytes. No, 60, um, yeah. 64,000 characters. Right. But they're only oh, okay. six bit characters, whereas the modern ones today are eight bit ones. Right. I'm learning about computers. Yeah. Just look at this one here. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, take your laptop home. <laughs> if I need a truck to put it in. I just happened to see this, Roy. I couldn't resist putting it up there. What's that? Yeah. Well, it's not me in the picture. I, do we want to say that? <laughs> um, but also, oh. th that, is, that is a scientific computer. I don't know what it is. It it could be um, it could be what were the early ones called? Ace and Deuce were the first couple of commercial ones. Uh, one of those was in the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington uh, on the banks mm. of the Thames. I went to see it, but it could be it could be that. But it's it's uh, it's more of a scientific computer, I think that one. Well, I mean they're just massive. <laughs> it's just it's kind of quite comical to today's uh, people, I think, really. Um, but you stayed in that computing job for quite a while, didn't you? I stayed in the computer service, uh, yes, for, for 20 years. Um, but I didn't stay as a computer programmer. I um, mm. moved on to becoming, well, senior programmer, then, then uh, systems analysis and design. And then I ended up running the project team that was doing all that kind of stuff. And the final job I had was Office System Support Manager. Now, basically, this was when computers started moving out of the computer room itself. And right. the council had some satellite places around. The cash offices each had their own little mini computer system. And uh, the social services offices around the borough also had their own little systems. And what, uh, what uh, the computer manager did was he set up a team to look after all the equipment and people, if you like, that weren't in the computer room. So in the computer room where it had obviously white coated um, computer operators and everything, there was about two million pounds worth of equipment at that time. Um, and outside in all the other offices, there was about one million pounds worth of equipment. And it was my job, my team's job, to look after that million pounds worth of equipment and uh, mm. look after the hardware, the software, the communications, training, everything to do with them. Goodness. 
Wow, <laughs> more than you would have learned at university. Uh, uh, now, yes. so here you've got your your family grown up. Yes, I have. Yes, well, the the the, the guy there over on the left is my brother Alan. And that's his wife next to him, Daphne. She is still alive. She celebrated her 90th birthday last year. Oh, my goodness. Um, and the, the, the other lady there is my sister, Avril, who is um, mm -hmm. five years older than I am. And that's her with her, the dog that she had at that time. Uh, she's a Samoyed. And that's and her she's back to garden. Stay. Yeah, Your she's coming to stay wow. with me. Beautiful. That's her yeah. back garden. Oh, my God, not mine. Oh, that's mm. mm. oh, a precious picture then. Um, but we're going to sort of go back a little bit here because we've got a picture of your wedding day. So oh, now indeed. Then, who was it that you married? Yeah, look at this, 1975. So that's, uh, yeah. I mean, people normally get time off for good behaviour, but in this particular case, I mean, this is going on now for nearly 47 years. <laughs> I need to ask Jackie what she thinks about that. <laughs> oh. She's actually here in so the room with me and she hasn't. Ah, she, 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 sorry. <laughs> She's not throwing just tomatoes through at you yet. <laughs> no, that wasn't a tomato. It was a ball of wool. But uh, no, <laughs> seriously, yes. So we got married in 1975. Uh, we mm. met through an inter church youth group. Um, I was still oh. at the Mission Methodist Church and she was. Um, here in St James's Church, Merton Park, which is in the same, mm. roughly the same area as Mitchum. I mean, it's, it's, it's all in the same borough now. And we met through that interchurch youth group, and, uh, and this was uh, when, when we got married. And when we did get married, we then set up home in um, Motspur Park, which is um, on the outskirts of Wimbledon, really. All right. So you left the Methodist church that your family had been to all your life so far and and Jackie left the Anglican church and where did you go? We, we went to New Malden Evangelical Free Church which was literally just around the corner um, from where we lived. It was in a place mm. called Seaforth Avenue uh, in, in Mosso Park and this is what it looks like. The, the church dates from the 1920s, church building dates from the 1920s. Mm. And they had a pastor so, there, a young mm. pastor called Clive Jones, who'd only been there six months when we arrived. Uh, excellent pastor. But the other person of significance who was there was actually Derek White, whom you mentioned at the beginning. Um, he was one of the elders at the church which means that obviously at times we heard him preach and he mm. was, well, not, not, a, not when we first went there, but certainly after a few years, he was beginning to get an understanding of God's purposes for Israel. Mm. So why, why did you not go to a Methodist or an Anglican? What made you look for this? Was it just convenience or something more? Um, it was it was more than convenience uh, that was mm. there. If um, put it this way, if if I hadn't been getting married to Jackie, I'd have left the Methodist Church earlier. Mm. Um, because about six months before um, our wedding date, six or seven months before, uh, when I was going to the midweek meeting at the Methodist Church, um, I had a, a stand up row with the with the minister who was there who did not believe that the Bible was true, and I did. Um, mm. And uh, when he said, well, you can't believe anything that in Matthew's gospel, uh, that was just about the end as far as I was concerned. And um, because my parents went to that church still, I, I thought, well, it's going to be awkward for them if I just get up and leave, but I'll stick mm. it out for another six months. Because I'm leaving then anyway. I mean, mm. I wouldn't have gone to a Methodist church um, mm. or that Methodist church anyway because it was not in mm. the area where we were going to live. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, you so so yeah. It, I'd been leaving that church. But we found yeah. that the Methodist church in the area where we were going to live wasn't that, wasn't that much better from the one that we had. Uh, I was trying to get mm. away from. And... Um, and, and Jackie was quite happy to change also from the Anglican Church. Yeah. So we went here to uh, New Orleans. And this was 
just round the corner. So you could say it was a leading of God. Now, this is not Jackie, but looks yeah. so much like Jackie. No. Yeah, well, I thought I, I thought you might like to see pictures of the children, our children, when they were a little bit older. So the older one here is our oldest daughter, and that's Jenny. Now, in her left arm, she is cradling her daughter, Sophie, and in her right arm is our third child, Jessica. Jessica mm. is one year older than her niece. So she's one year, yes, than her niece, yeah. But I, I love the expression that Jessica's pulling, <laughs> crinkling her nose. <laughs> it's brilliant. So, yeah, go on. Yeah, and this then is... This is Plasbury Guest House. In 1988, we left London and we moved to Llandidno, which is where we are now, not in this house, uh, but in, uh, in North Wales, and we bought mm -hmm. this guest house. And um, so we exchanged our three-bed semi and we bought this for the same price, basically, which is seven-bed, four-reset, detached, mm -hmm. Uh, in Clandidna. And we ran a guest house for the next 11 years. So, you had you been to Israel by this stage yourself? Yes, we had. Oh, yes. You'd been we, we went to Israel. We, we, we went to Israel in 1976, so when we'd been married yeah. just a year. Um, mm. And on, on that tour, it, it was a standard um, Christian pilgrimage package tour, two weeks. And it was it, we visited the church where Jesus did that and the church where Jesus did this and goodness knows what else. Um, throughout that time, it was a great tour. We loved every minute of it. In fact, my mum and dad came with us as well. Uh, mum had never visited Israel and dad was revisiting for the first time since he'd been billeted there in the Second World War. Mm. He was amazed to see the differences, but it, we also um, got the driver of our bus to um, go round in Haifa because we were we'd been to Haifa anyway, yeah. and yeah. show yeah. him the place where his base had been. It was still there and in use as the bus garage for the the, 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 the town there. So he was delighted <laughs> to see his old place of work uh, so many years later. What's, what's that? Thirty years yeah. later. Gosh, that's amazing. So yeah. So, so yeah, so we had a really good tour. But um, it was, I knew I'd missed something. Yeah. I knew that, I, I knew that there was something about Israel that I hadn't got mm. hold of, although I'd spent two weeks there. Mm. Mm. So we'll come back to that in mm. a moment. But we just need to just have a look at your son, who's also holding yeah, and, uh, Jessica, I think. The same. Yeah. Yeah, he's holding Jessica as well. But yes, that's our son David. Um, uh -huh. So he he he's two years younger than Jenny, and then there's a yeah. twenty year gap between him and number three. Whoa! <laughs> we do things differently in our family. <laughs> yes, and this is your youngest, one, <clears throat> slightly older. Yeah, this is Jessica. This is she's, she's a bit older yeah. here. Uh, this is when we were up in yeah. North Wales. Well, she was mm. born up here in in North Wales. Uh, but right. I don't know how old she is there. Seven, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, like six, seven. Yeah, seven or eight. I'd guess. Something right, like okay. So we've got a little... Um, back in, I think it was 1993. He's not very loud here, Elias. Of Israel in the UK. At that time, Roy was a member of the Board of Trustees. And he was always really affirming and supportive, encouraging of the staff. Later on, Roy produced the Kesha course, which has been tremendously well received and used around the country and I believe abroad as well. And it was my privilege to work with Roy on the Hebrew word studies part of that course. One of the things I really like about Roy is no matter what he's doing, and he's held some really quite senior positions over the years, is he has a lovely, willing, uh, cheerful servant attitude. He just wants to get on, get stuck in and to serve the Lord. And uh, it's a real privilege to know Roy. Uh, he's a great guy. And I really praise God for him. <laughs> mm. 
Well, you weren't expecting that, Roy. <laughs> so You're absolutely that right. Man is, <laughs> he's John Smith, who actually is the minister of Watchorn Church, which was a Methodist church. So um, Methodists can come up trumps. So here is the Kesha course. And uh, it's the Kesha course that you devised. Yes. Um, now, I, I had, by this time, I, I had come on into an understanding of God's purposes for Israel. And, I mean, that was mm. when we were back in uh, Mosba Park. And what happened was that I went along to hear uh, a, a guy that some of you may have heard of called David Paulson. Um, <laughs> And he was speaking on the subject of it is time for the church to repay its debt to the Jewish people. And this was at Queen's Road Baptist Church in Wimbledon. And when I heard him speak, I realized that the one thing that I had missed in Israel was the Jews. That I'd been there on a Christian pilgrimage tour and I'd come away with no understanding of the Jews. Mm. Now that might sound absolutely ridiculous. How can you go to the national home of the Jews and miss the Jews? But you see, we had an Arab driver. We had an Arab uh -huh. guide. We stayed in Arab hotels. We visited Christian mm. sites. So therefore there was very, very little contact with anything Jewish, either people or places. I think the Western Wall was the only place we went that you could call Jewish. Mm. So mm. I, it dawned on me then through David Pawson, and I, I did uh, have long chats with him um, later in life and thanked him for his input. Um, I know he's gone to be with the Lord since then. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, so I had got this understanding of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith and the significance of Israel today. Mm. And um, Derek White, of course, at that stage had started up the UK branch of Christian Friends of Israel. So I got involved with that. And mm. um, when we came up to Klandipno, uh, we got involved in a church up there. And that is where the Kesha course started. The story is mm. very interesting. Um, we were running Alpha in the church, and on this particular occasion, it was the autumn of uh, 96, must have been, uh, yeah, autumn of 96, um, I, I was running the course, and uh, those of you who know Alpha will know that you kind of start with a meal, and then you have the main talk, and then you go into discussion groups. Well, the main talk, that year, we, at that time we were doing it, we were actually using the videos that um, uh, HTB produced. So once the meal had been cleared away, there was nothing for me to do as a leader for about 45, 50 minutes while the talk went on, because I'd heard the talk several times before anyway. So I went to do the washing up. So I was doing the washing up in the, in, in the little kitchen place uh, at the church, and the thought entered my head, could the alpha format be used in some way to do a course on the Jewish roots of the Christian faith and the significance of Israel? And immediately I had that thought. I thought, well, yeah, it could, but what would I include in it? And then the 10 topics which are in the Kesha course to this day, they came to me instantly one after another just mm. this, these are the ones that are in the right order as well and then i also had this thought about a, doing a hebrew word study and um uh, as part of it and mm. i thought i've got to i've got to write this down before i forget uh, you know what have i got and my bag, which contained my writing pad and my pen and everything, this was in the main room where they were all watching the video. And, and I didn't want to go in there and disturb them. So I hunted around in the kitchen. And the only piece of paper I could find was a used shopping list in the in, in dustbin. 
And um, I took that out. It was blank on the back. So that was OK. I got, I got a piece of paper to write on. But I couldn't find a pen. But I did find a crayon on the floor left over from the crèche that we used to meet in there on a Sunday. So I wrote down the 10 topics of the Kesha course in crayon on the back of this used shopping list. <laughs> and um, that was how Kesha came into being. Not, not that we called it that at the time, but it, that's how the course came into being. Mm. That's really fantastic. Well, we're going to hear a clip of it in a moment. Um, this could be the church. This is your church in London now? That, that was the church where we were at the time, yes, which is, which is where this happened. I must say that right. although this, right. although this uh, had come to me, I'm one of these people who... Um, it's, it's never it, it's difficult to convince that something that mm. has happened is of god rather than yep. of me yep. and so uh, i know it sounds a pretty sort of amazing story but i was still wasn't sure that this was whether this was of me or whether it was of god but i was on the board of uh, cfi as, as john smith mentioned and um we had a board retreat in the following january just a couple of months later and it was there that it became clear to me that this was of God. Uh, what happened was, was that the, the chairman of the board said to us, well, look, we're going to split up into two groups. And one's going to look at the admin problems that we have at the moment, see what we can do to sort them out. And the other group's going to look at how we reach out to new people. So we split into two groups. And he gave me the admin ones to do because I was, uh, you know, into systems analysis and design and everything. And uh, a lady called Alison Marchant, who should be well known to everybody in CMJ anyway, she was leading the other group. And when we got back to share together, when it came to Alison's turn, she said, well, she said, I think what we need is a course a bit like the Alpha course, which explores the Jewish roots of Christianity and the significance mm. of Israel. So I took out yeah. this piece of paper, which I had rewritten in the meantime, not in crayon, and just given it a little bit of flesh, passed it to her and said, do you mean something like this? And she read it through and looked at me in a way that only Alison can look at somebody. And she said, that's exactly what I mean. And if you know Alison, I'm sure you can picture her saying that to me. And at that point, I realized that probably this was of God and not just of me. That's fantastic. Well, here you are, 13 years ago, I think it is. So it's uh, uh, an older version, but speaking... We're going to be looking of, at on the, the subject of the Jewishness session. of Jesus. Our first three sessions really are all looking at the person of Jesus. It's actually interesting to note what other people say about Jesus. And I've got some examples that come from a churchgoer's perspective. From some Sunday school material found in the USA, Jesus was a good Christian boy who went to church every Sunday. Another one, Jesus is the founder of the Christian church. Maybe. From a Catholic schoolgirl, Jesus was a Catholic. And from the minister of a well-known evangelical church in London, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a Palestinian girl all various different perspectives on who Jesus is. Today, we also have the concept of the cosmic Christ, which is very popular in New Age teachings. And we have the Palestinians claiming Jesus as the first Palestinian Christian, or indeed, as a Palestinian martyr. What we're going to try to do is see Jesus in his historical context as a real Jewish man. But actually, you know, when some Christians do discover that Jesus is Jewish, there can be a very interesting reaction. One visitor to the garden tomb in Jerusalem said this, if I had known Jesus was Jewish, I would not have become a Christian. And the warden of the garden tomb said in a TV program that some visitors, when told that Jesus was buried in a Jewish tomb, say, but surely it was a Christian tomb. This demonstrates a latent anti-Semitism that is all too common. There's an example of Palestinian claims to Jesus. 
There was a banner in Manger Square in Bethlehem in December 1995, and on it was written in Arabic, Welcome to Bethlehem, the town of the first Palestinian revolutionary, Jesus. And another classic example of anti-Semitism in the church from a New Testament scholar in the USA. The first thing you must do to be a good Christian is to kill the Jew inside of you. This all demonstrates a total misunderstanding of who he is. So let us begin by looking at the Jewishness of Jesus and reading from Matthew's Gospel. Wow, that's uh, absolutely amazing, Roy. And uh, I just absolutely love the comment in the garden tomb, if I'd known Jesus was Jewish, I wouldn't have become a Christian. I mean, that just takes the biscuit, doesn't it? <laughs> it's just, I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, it uh, certainly and, does. Yeah. Go on. So here, who's the chappy here with his wife? That's John Smith. Yeah. The chappy who spoke about you a moment ago. This is him now. Yeah, John and, and he's just going to, Yeah, yeah. We're just going to hear a little bit, just a very short bit, about one from one of the Hebrew words. Now studies. then, back, uh, finally we come to the word itself, amen, which means really, truly, verily. It can be a trigger. And in the New Testament, quite often we hear Jesus saying, amen, I tell you that. Uh, people tend to think sometimes that it comes actually at the end of a phrase, but actually it's, a, it's an intro introduction. Truly, I say to you that it introduces a phrase. So he's speaking the truth, and what he's about to say is something uh, trustworthy and reliable. We use it as a, uh, at the end of a prayer or at the end of some, somebody saying something as an affirmation. Uh, the way I like to think of it is we're saying, when someone prays, we have to agree with what they pray, don't we? Otherwise, we shouldn't really be saying amen. But if we agree with them, we're saying, I will stand with you in that prayer. What you have said is true and right. I believe God will answer us. So there's these ideas of standing, truth, and believing. That's amen. I love this verse, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, because it sums up the whole of this route. The rock, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of emunah, el emunah, without falsehood or deceit or injustice, righteous and upright as he. Sadiq v'yashar hu. Fantastic. So reliable and trustworthy. And that's from Deuteronomy. Seems to have gone off. So why is it important for Christians to know a few Hebrew words? It helps to understand what Jesus is saying when you know the, the Hebrew word that is being used at that time and what that Hebrew word means. He, Hebrew words... Uh, are pictorial, um, if you like. Um, so they give a, a, a range of, of meanings. It's a, it's a garden, if you like, to pick out from mm. the bits that you actually, you know, fit in the context. And it just adds a huge amount of richness to, the, to your, your mm. Bible study. We, we had, um, well, more than one, but one couple in church who um who said to me oh i don't know why we're having to sing in foreign languages we're english we need everything in english and we don't want any of this hebrew stuff and i had to smile as they said amen to every prayer <laughs> or they said <laughs> hallelujah you know because we use hebrew without knowing that we've always used some hebrew words and i think that that says it all. Okay, so yeah, what's absolutely. what is the importance for the church to know its Jewish roots, Roy? It is the root of our faith. I mean, Paul says that quite clearly in Romans, that we are grafted in to 
the Jewish olive tree. And with, with, if we are not grafted in, we can't grow, we will die. It's as simple as that. Mm. If you cut off a branch, it doesn't last long. But if it's still attached to the tree, it will grow. It is the way, it, it's, it's God's church growth movement, if you like. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we could go on and discuss that further, actually. And uh, and what should church look like nowadays? And should we reflect a more Jewish church? But uh, we'll maybe have to leave that for another time. So let's just move on. I and, one uh, hour, not three. <laughs> we could continue for three. But you were called away from Landudno again, back down to Eastbourne. What happened here? Yeah, well, the board, did, uh, well, De Derek White, who's the director, you can see him in this picture, top left. Um, he he wanted to retire as, as director. He was the founder director of CFI. And so the board were looking for somebody to take over from him. And they asked me if I would. I'm just standing there in front of him in case you rec can't recognize that young looking figure there. Um, <laughs> so... Um, they asked me if we would, and we prayed about it, and we decided it was right to do so. So we sold our guest house in Clendidno, mm. and we moved down to Sussex. And then uh, here we are. This is with the, the first first staff, if you like, that were there. Obviously, Derek was still there. His, his wife, mm. Grace, who has subsequently gone to be with the Lord, she's standing there um, in the front row, the uh, just in front of him. And you can see Alison there as well. She was working for CFI at that time, Alison Marchant. Um, so you'll oh. know them. Are you oh, oh yeah. yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So there we I know Alison. So that was a very yeah. good photo outside of our office. Good. Now, and when and I was there, I discovered... another... Yeah. Hmm? Well, I, I discovered when I became a director that one of my jobs was going to be to run tours to Israel. And this is one of the <laughs> early tours oh, I that I went out with. Yeah. yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. But I'd never run a tour yeah. before. But um, it, in, in uh, 2001, I had met um, a guy called Philip Hunter, of blessed memory now. Um, he, he was running uh, another ministry called Exobus. That's what it was mm. called at that time. And mm. uh, he ran tours to Israel. And there were no tours going because of the intifada oh yeah yeah uh, so, yeah so so there were no tours going at all and then the intifada was just about coming to an end this was 2000 2001 and so he said yeah. look we need to do a solidarity tour can we do it jointly mm. maybe several ministries well the only two that he eventually did it was his um, cfi so we went together and i said look i've never run a um a tour to israel at all he said don't worry he said leave it all to me you just look after your coach I'll do all the teaching. I'll do all the teaching. Don't worry about it. Just learn from me because oh. I've done it before. Brilliant. Very good. Excellent. Except, uh, Wonderful. We had 137 people on the tour. And because we had 137 people on the tour, they couldn't all fly out in the same, couldn't get all on the same flight. So he took mm -hmm. out a red eye flight um, and I was left to bring the rest the following day. So my first mm. job as a rookie leader that had never done it before was to meet 92 people at Heathrow Airport and get them on board the plane. It was shattered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, you know, we better just push on a little bit because we're running out of time. Just quickly, what's this? I think we were there as well. And we okay. were also in Israel. Yeah. yeah this, this is in Trafalgar Square. It's a rally in support of, of Israel, which is organized by the Jewish community. I found out mm. about it, first of all, from a guy called Tony Pierce, who is still around with us again. And um, we asked, can we come as well? Uh, which quite surprised the Jewish people, but they mm. recognized that we could get people there. And so we asked mm. the specific banners that showed it was Christians standing shoulder to shoulder with Israel, because Jews standing up for Israel is not news, Christians mm. is. So any That's photographers right. there should see that there were Christians supporting. And we reckon we had about 3,000 there out of the 30,000 yeah. people. Very significant. Yeah. I think uh, we were there too. Now here's a very famous man, Rabbi Sachs, and you're meeting him. I am indeed, because the Jewish people were so um, thrilled with what we had done that they put on this special mm. reception for us at the 
this marks synagogue in London, the oldest synagogue in the country. And uh, of course, I was invited, but um, found that Rabbi Sachs was there as well. It's really good. Now, this here, one, I thought I thought you were in Wales, but actually, you were in Italy. Yep, that's San Remo. You get to go to some really dumb places, you know, when you have to. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. I was there for the 90th anniversary of the San Remo conference, which um, came up with the original, the mandate for Palestine that was then awarded to Britain. So we went there to celebrate the 90th anniversary of that. I say we, yeah. that was organized by the European Coalition for Israel. And uh, there were various mm -hmm. different people from European countries who were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those was me. Again, a very significant time because it set off a whole load of things um, in this mm. country from the Brits who were out there. That's right. And uh, and here, very quickly, um, a fantastic event that uh, Love Never Fails put on, and, and I was on the committee with you at the time. Yeah. Yeah, well, we actually had to set up a separate company to run it because it's far too big for Love Never Fails. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah, but and, and I was treasurer of Bell for 100 Limited. But yeah, um, yeah this, this, is, this shows 100 young people on stage uh, who were mm. um, promising to carry the baton beyond uh, because obviously, you know, changing generations and whatever. So it's very significant. Yeah, I hope they are. That is. So here um, we had the reenactment. And you might know David Schmidt and Kelvin Crombie. I think Paul Hames is yep. at the back there. And some of the Anzacs that Kelvin brought across. So that was an amazing event, wasn't it, really? Look how full. You know, you said a moment ago about the Jewish community being uh, impressed with the Trafalgar Square support, solidarity with Israel. But here we had nearly 4,000 people. Yep. Um, yeah, we did. It was quite awesome. That's it, empty. But no one expected nearly <laughs> 4,000 people. <laughs> and uh, and the Jewish community were absolutely blown away, weren't they? Who's that? They were. Now, this uh, this there is one of the, 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 our final speakers, and that is Mark Regev, who was the Israeli ambassador at the time here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And he was overwhelmed by the response. Mm -hmm. He walked on stage. He, he was announced, obviously. He walked on stage. And he received a standing ovation before he had opened his mouth. And then his speech, which I think was timed at about three minutes, took 10 because every at the end of every sentence, he got another ovation. Yeah. Now, this all had a huge effect upon him. Um, and he went back and told them in the embassy what had happened to him. But I, I met him three, nearly four months later in Cardiff yeah. at a meeting. And he was still yeah. talking about the Royal Albert Hall then. Mm, I remember, yeah, mm. that, mm. amazing. And uh, and here you are. Look, been a very impressive setup here. <laughs> oh yeah, that's in Stormont in Northern <laughs> Ireland, and that was two days oh, after the, 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 the in the yeah, Royal Albert Hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so this is what yeah. happens when you're uh, you're in this. And so now here, you're back in. Are you back in Wales this is back or in are you in Ireland? No, ah. this is back in Clendon. No, this is our war memorial. Yeah. Uh, neither of those gentlemen yeah. or myself, by the way. Uh, but that is the mayor, and that is a member of the Jewish community. Um, he's died subsequently. His name is Bernard Blank. Mm -hmm. He actually fought in Israel's War of Independence. And every wow. year we have, we have a commemoration of the Holocaust in or around Holocaust mm. Memorial Day. So that's something that mm. I, I'm still doing now. Yeah, it's wonderful. Now we haven't touched on everything that you've done or been a part of like Hatik for Films on the board for them and, and other things. But uh, one new venture that you've got yourself involved in is with CMJ and it's the Bible come to life. Yeah. What on earth are you doing here? <laughs> well, what are you doing? Uh, th th we're doing a drama at this point. But what happened is that um, we had the Bible Come to Life exhibition at our church here in Clandidno, um, and yeah. they were up, they were short of um, volunteers that week, and so we said, oh, "Well, we'll volunteer." And we so enjoyed it mm -hmm. that we then said, "Look, can we volunteer anywhere else?" Uh, so we're part of the mm -hmm. team, 
This was actually mm. at, uh, in, in Belfast when we were out there. And as, as mm. well as you know, being on the exhibitions, um, they, we occasionally do little, little dramas to illustrate a point. Now, uh, me, that's the one on the right, by the way, just in case you didn't know. Um, but I, I actually have, a, as, as a character, I am Joseph of Arimathea. And uh, there is, my, that's Jackie there, and she is acting as one of the ladies who, uh, Mary, who went to the tomb and discovered it was empty. So uh, she's brought the news to Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb it had been, that his tomb had mm. been raided and, and the body had gone. But um, so, uh, not quite. Roy, but, so you, we, you would recommend, you would recommend the Bible come to life exhibition in churches? absolutely would and uh and if you really want to see what a bit of what it looks like then the place to go is the cmj conference this year because there's going mm -hmm. to be part of the exhibition there jackie and i are going to be there as well we may well be looking in, in uh, um, costume for all i know right we were going to have the conference slide up next but um we uh in order to find out when the conference is, it's the beginning of July, just go to cmj.org.uk on our website and all the information that you need is there and all the information about the other meetings that are coming up. Oh, here we are, look. So it's Gavin Calver, who is the CEO of the Evangelical Alliance, and he's going to be our keynote speaker. It's in Yarnfield this year, which is in Staffordshire. So it's a new place for us, a new venture. But lots of people will be going and there's plenty of opportunity to bring children and for teenagers, for the youth. Um, and there will be the Bible come to life, will be exposed. There will be a, an exhibition. You'll be able to see it and, and perhaps sign your church up to have one in the future. Um, we've got lots of things going on at CMJ. Do have a look at our website. And if you want to give to the work of CMJ, please look on our website. It's very easy to give something to support the work that we do. And all remains for me now is to say a massive thank you to Roy Thurley, who uh, I do believe we've tentatively agreed on doing a residential Kesha course at the end of September this year. And, and if that comes off, you're more than welcome to join us there. Look on our website for all the details because they'll be there. Um, so, Roy, thank you for tonight. Thank you so much. It's been really great having you on uh, and look forward to the next meeting. Well, thank you very much, Jane. It's been a privilege to be here, honestly. Thank you. <laughs> Good night.